Okay, hey guys, uh, Dutch Boyd here. If you don't know who I am, I'm a, pro I'm a professional poker player and three-time World Series of Poker Bracelet winner living right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And this is my poker clinic where I talk through and explain some basic and some not so basic concepts in poker in an effort to help you improve your game and win more money at the poker tables. So today, in the poker clinic, we're gonna talk about finding spots. And this is going to be the first of a two-parter, uh, just because I think that, th that the uh, subject is extensive enough that I don't want to try to cram it all in a single presentation. So for those of you who, who have been tuning into my Twitch TV channel, uh, where I live stream myself playing real money online poker tournaments on WSP.com, you'll often hear me say a few catchphrases when navigating uh, the field of a multi-table tournament. And one of those phrases is spots, not hands. Um, but, but what does that mean exactly? Spots, not hands. You know, basically, it means one of your primary goals at a poker table should be to identify and take advantage of situations where you can turn a losing or marginal hand into a winner. Um, so, so that begs the question, right? What are the spots we should be looking for? And that is the first topic of our, of our poker clinic today. We're, we're going to try to and identify most of the types of spots you should be looking for at the poker table. And I should mention at this point that we're primarily focusing on the types of spots that you'll see in No Limit Hold'em tournaments. Uh, there, there are going to be a lot of game-specific spots that are outside the scope of today's clinic. You know, for example, suppose you're playing Raz and have an ace showing, uh, but have two kings in the hole. So this isn't a great starting hand, you know, an ace showing two kings in the hole in Raz, it, it, that's, in, in fact, it's a horrible starting hand. You know, you're starting with a pair of kings and you're going for the lowest hand. But if you are in late position and there is only like one low card between you and the bring-in, which we'll say is like a queen, uh, this is usually a great spot to raise and try to pick up the, the, the bring-in the antes. Um, let's take another example from another game. Let's say, suppose you're playing uh, PLO, Pot Limit Omaha, and you have all four aces in your hand right this isn't the greatest starting hand because you know if uh you know you're pretty much just going to be, to, to have one pair uh at at the end of the uh at the end of the hand right but let's say that you do decide to raise and you get called and the flop comes out with like three to a flush the fact that you know your opponent can't have the nut flush you know creates a good bluffing spot for you to represent the nuts by firing a few pot-sized bullets uh, but let's get back to where we're focusing on today, and that's No Limit Hold'em. And specifically, No Limit Hold'em tournaments, the Cadillac of poker, right? So when we're talking about finding spots in No Limit Hold'em, I think it's most useful to categorize the spots we're looking for by the four different betting streets. Preflop, flop, turn, and river. So let's just go through these types of spots in order. And in today's poker clinic, we're going to be focusing on the pre-flop spots, right? So let's look at pre-flop spots. And we're going to start with a classic blind steal. So it's been said that poker tournaments are not won. They're stolen. Uh, I've already done a whole poker clinic about the power and importance of blind stealing and c-betting. Uh, another spot we'll get to post-flop. And if you missed that poker clinic, I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, but today we're just going to stick with the point that blind stealing is one of those go-to spots that you should always be on the lookout for. Uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you can raise pre-flop and have a decent chance of you know, winning the pot right then and there, that's, that's the spot that you're looking for. We're going to define a blind steal pretty specifically though as a raise where you are the first to voluntarily enter the pot. We're drawing a distinction here between other pre-flop moves where you're three betting an opener or raising an open limper and making some sort of squeeze play. And we'll get to those here in a minute. But the classic blind steal is going to be those times when you're raising pre-flop and nobody else has voluntarily put money into the pot. In, in these spots, you're most likely to get resistance from the players who feel invested in the pot already, namely the small and the big blind. So now when, when you're playing No Limit Hold'em, I'd strongly encourage you not to think about the small blind and big blind as your blind. Uh, and it really goes for any time you put money into the pot. As soon as you let go of those chips, you need to stop thinking about it as yours. I want to, uh, I want to turn briefly to one of my favorite subjects in poker, and it's the idea of cognitive bias, right? And specifically the idea of sunk cost fallacy. 
Cognitive bias is any tendency that we have which interferes with standard logic and rational decision making. Cognitive bias was first introduced by my two favorite economists, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Uh, you'll remember Daniel Kahneman, uh, you know, he wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. We've talked a little bit about cognitive bias before. I also mentioned it in my book Poker Tilt when I talk about prospect theory and loss aversion. Uh, but re remember those two names, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, because we'll be talking a lot about these guys and their contribution to you know, economics and psychology and gambling theory and future poker clinics. But for now, just trust me when I say that the basic idea in traditional economics that we're all rational actors is outdated and was turned on its head by these two guys. You know, since they introduced the basic idea of cognitive bias, a lot of researchers, researchers have come along uh, and, and started examining the different types of bias that you know, we as humans exhibit. And in 1976, a guy named Barry Shaw wrote a paper deal, de, you know, detailing what is now known as the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, and then it was called, you know, kind of an unwieldy term, escalation of commitment. Now we call it sunk cost. The basic idea is that people are willing to justify an increased investment into a situation based on the cumulative prior investment. So think of it as like throwing good money after bad or in for a penny and for a pound. The idea that you know, you're, you're more, uh, more willing to spend extra money fixing up a house the more that you've already put into it. You know, sunk cost fallacy. In poker, we need to be aware of this cognitive bias and do our best not to let it cloud our judgment you know, in, in our own decisions. Uh, as soon as we release chips into a pot, we need to stop thinking about those chips as ours. So uh, what does this mean for our blind stealing spots, right? And really any spot at all is we need to understand that uh, what the sunk cost fallacy means for picking spots is that the more invested someone is into a pot, the less likely it is that we can get them to fold. Uh, that is why when, when we're blind stealing, it doesn't matter what position we're stealing from, we can still expect the primary resistance to be from the players who have already invested chips into the pot. And those are the blinds. So, when we're deciding whether to steal the blinds or not, the main thing we should be looking for are players who don't defend. Now, while we can say it's more likely to get through the uninvested players the later we steal, I'm going to suggest to you that the defending percentage of the blind is actually more important than the position we find ourselves in. We need to be looking, you know, we need to always be on the lookout for tight blinds. Now, online we can utilize like HUDs like Poker Tracker or Hold'em Manager uh, to actually track the percentage of time a player defends their blind against a pre-flop raise. Uh, live and in online arenas where HUDs aren't allowed, like the Nevada tournaments that I play on in Twi you know, on Twitch, you kind of have to guesstimate. And we can sometimes use the type of preflop tells that we've been discussing on our HPT viewing parties. You know, like the examples of like all those preflop whole card peak tells. Uh, like the length of time a player looks at their cards, for example. Or maybe like, you know, you might find that, uh, that uh, you know, the big blind, you know, makes a, makes a big display of putting a chip on their card or, or a card protector on their card when they really have no intention of playing the hand. Now, this is why we, we say that it's so important not to look at your whole cards before it's your turn to act because if you're in the big blind or the small blind and you're indicating that you're not going to defend to uh, a pre-flop opener it's a huge mistake huge mistake and it's something that you know we as players should be constantly looking for those kind of pre-flop whole card tells the peak tells that indicate that a player is or isn't going to defend so uh, you know, there's always obvious spots where a player won't defend, and let's look at it. You know, let's look at one of the really obvious ones, and that's when, you know, the the player isn't even there. You know, online you'll see that this player is sitting out. You know, uh, maybe live they, you know, had to take a call or go to a restroom. I mean, the, the spot where the big blind isn't even at the table. These are always great spots to attempt a blind steal. You know, your chances of getting through without a flop are so much higher if the big blind isn't there. Uh, you can also Look at multi tables, like multi tablers. You know, if, if someone's multi tabling, like a known multi tabler, uh, you can generally assume that a player who's multi tabling is going to be a lot less likely to defend their big blind with weak holdings. They're going to be kind of on autopilot, and you know, they're a lot more likely to look down at a, at a uh, you know a big blind with like nine six offsuit and just auto fold it. A, a lot of times they're even using the uh, you know the, the the preflop action buttons 
So they're not really giving it any thought apart from when they first get dealt the hand and decide whether they're going to play or not. And this is why a lot of times when I'm in early position against a known multi-tabler on WSP.com, uh, I'm a lot more inclined to give it a loose raise and try to get through their big blind. So you know, be aware of that, especially when you're multi-tabling. And let's take a look. We've got uh, I want to talk about position when you're blind stealing. Uh, as it relates to stealing blinds, and I'm going to go outside the normal thinking here and suggest that position is, is just not as important as you might think when it comes to blind stealing. I, I'll get a lot of people who kind of question why I might make a, a, a blind steal, a, you know, a weak raise with like a 10-8 offsuit or, you know, a, a pure bluff with like a queen-3 suited under the gun. Um, and, you know, it might make sense that a blind steal is more likely to get through in later positions since it's far less likely that one of, you know, say three opponents, w you know, wakes up with a monster hand as opposed to a full table. In, in my experience, I found the defend rate of the big blind is a much bigger indicator of whether the steal gets through or not uh, than where you're making the steal from. So if I see a guy who just doesn't defend his big blind against like a, a button raise or a cutoff raise and is, is really easy to get through, I'm going to be attacking that big blind no matter what position I'm in. And I'm going to, I'm going to say that, that that defend percentage is a lot more important when you're stealing blinds than what position you find yourself in. You know, keep in mind that when you make a blind steal from early position, anybody who calls be, you know, behind you has to worry about all the other players left to act. So imagine you're under the gun plus one with like pocket eights or ace jack off suit and an under the gun player raises. You know, it looks much, much stronger, uh, his raise, and it's scarier to make that call then, you know, for example, if the opening raise is coming from the hijack and you're on the button. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, position's always going to be important in poker. But in my experience, the position you are at the table when you're making a blind steal is, is much more important, you know, for setting up the post-flop plays than determining whether or not a blind steal gets through. So, more important than position is going to be whatever defend percentage... Uh, a, a player is going to be making in the big blind. So you're going to often see me, you know, make a, a blind steal under the gun or under the gun plus one if the big blind isn't there, for example, or if the big blind is a player who is super tight, super nitty, and trying to, you know, stall his way up a money bubble jump, for example. Um, just something to kind of think about. We're going to take a, a quick second and look at the chat here. Um... Big shout out again to everybody who's here. We've got, I uh, we already said, you know, hi to a lot of you guys. Avid Day, Iceman Kiwi, Sneebuck, Gullock33. Good to see you too, man. And let's see, do we have, we've got the Poker Clueless given the, uh, it's Poker Clinic number two. It doesn't look like we really have any, uh, any big questions right now. So we're going to go ahead and just, Continue on with the presentation, then we'll get to uh, get to the end. What's up, Bony Fish and Killer Chaser? Good to see you guys. Grinding and ground, Nate Dowland. Big uh, big shout out to you and Dogfish Phil. Okay, so let's go to another uh, little thing about. Blind stealing. I want to mention this. It's important when blind stealing not to make a player feel like you're singling them out for your moves. If a player feels like you're bullying them, they're a lot more likely to defend or even three bet your opening uh, blind steals. So in general, I try to avoid stealing the same player's big blind twice in a row. Um, I also try to avoid giving the impression that I'm bullying the table. So unless I have a huge stack and the situation is just right, I'm a lot less likely to make two pure blind steals in back-to-back -back hands. Uh, and sometimes we'll break this general rule uh, based on stack sizes and other psychological inflection points. But for the most part, we stick to that general concept. Um, and I want to introduce another little catchphrase. Be the bully, but don't look like the bully. Right? I think it's important in No Limit Hold'em tournaments, especially when you're uh, doing a lot of blind stealing, uh, not to make any 
individual player feel like you're you know directly targeting them and not you know not to really appear like you're just trying to bully the whole table so let's look at another pre-flop spot and this is one of my favorites raising the open limper right one of the biggest mistakes i see in a poker tournament is when players open limp the mistake gets bigger as the antis hit and the blinds increase so if a player open limps you know, in the very first round, I'm not really inclined to give him like a bony fish, but that's pretty much the quickest way you can get a bony fish when we're playing online on WSP.com is the ante's hit. We're playing the 100, 200, ante, 25 level, and you make an open limp in middle position. Bony fish every time. I mean, this mistake gets bigger as the ante's hit and the blinds increase. <sighs> Most players understand that when they have a big hand, they should be raising to inflate the pot. So when you see a player open limp, the majority of the time they're doing it with a hand that they just want to see a cheap flop with. You know, hands like weak aces, like suited connectors, low suited connectors and one gappers, unsuited court cards like jack 10 offsuit or queen 10 offsuit, uh, or even you know complete shit hands like queen 5 suit or a king 7 offsuit. And it, it's true that sometimes these, these players uh, might be open limping with a very strong hand, you know, setting up the trap with like aces or slow playing kings. Uh, th but the vast majority of the time you see a player open limp, they're doing it with a marginal to weak hand. And they're asking you to take the pot away from them. They're just asking you to take the pot. Keep in mind, you know, when they are slow playing, they'll usually let you know pre-flop with a three bet limp raise. Uh, they're gonna let you know. And you, you should usually trust that a player who is limping and then raising your raise is just transparent and getting tricky with aces or kings and play accordingly you know sometimes you're gonna be deep enough where if you know a player has aces um, you should still basically call and try to crack their aces because it can figure that you're going to be getting a huge pot from them in those times when you actually make your hand right so just play accordingly when when a, a player makes a limp and then three bets your uh, your your limp raise um, sometimes you're able to just take it with the raise uh, and my standard formula for raising the open limper is generally you know, whatever my open ra opening raise would be for a blind steal, plus the open limp amount and any calls uh, behind the open limp. So, for example, let's say you're playing 100-200 with a 25 ante, uh, and generally I'd be opening there 2.5x the big blind, so I'd be making it 500 generally. If I see an open limp and then two callers, right? I'm going to be making it my 500 plus the open limp plus the 200 plus the 200 for the, the two callers. You're coming up with 500 plus 200 plus 200 plus 200, so 1100. Uh, keep in mind that even if it doesn't get through pre flop, you're often going to be getting it heads up and you'll be set up for a, a really nice post flop continuation bet. So let's continue. We got raising the small blind call. You know, this is a this is a spot that I also love, and it's going to happen when you're in the big blind, and everyone folds to the small blind who decides to just go ahead and throw out, um, you know, th throw out the call, you know, a, a half big blind call, and then it's up to you, and you can check and see a free flop, or you can raise and put a little more pressure on that small blind. A lot of times, um, a raise is going to get through. A lot of times, if you just make it three times a big blind. The small blind who you know looks at a, a super marginal hand and thinks, okay, well, I'm getting enough odds to just call any two cards here for half a big blind. A, a lot of times, it's they're, they're going to just give up if you make it three x. And the fact that they didn't raise, you know, most standard players that you're going to be up against in no limit hold'em tournaments, if they actually have a really big hand in the small blind, they're going to be coming at you. They're going to be raising. So this is. Uh, this is one of my favorite pre-flop spots, seeing a small blind call and punishing them from the big blind. A lot of times it gets through. When it doesn't, you're going to have position on them, and you're going to be set up really nicely for a post-flop uh, continuation bet. Let's take a look at the next one. Three betting the wide opener. So this is going to happen when uh, there's a player at your table who who's VPIP and PFR percentages are a little bit higher. You know that they're going to be, uh, you, know, you know, usually these players are good, right? And they're making a lot of uh, a lot of blind stealing, you know, a, bl a lot of blind steals themselves. Um, 
So sometimes you're going to go ahead and take a stand against them and make a little three bet. You're going to assume that they're not really coming along with, you know, the, the, the top, top of their range. And usually you want to do, be doing this when you have position on the three better, you know, or, or position on the opener. You're, you're making the three bet, and I'm generally making it about 2.5x. Uh, what they're making it. So if they're making it 500 at the 100, 200, and 25 level, I'm going for about 1250. And if I'm out of position and three betting, if I'm going to be out of position on, on future streets of the hand, I'll generally make it a little bit more. So if I'm in the small blind and three betting a wide opener, I'm going for like a 3x rather than a 2.5x. Um, Generally, what you want to be looking for is high VPIP and high P, uh, PFR percentages, um, but kind of low four betting percentages, and and you you're looking for those those kind of players who are willing to give up. And this is going to be really effective these three bets when the opener, the original opener, is adjusting their preflop raise amount based on hand strength. I can't tell you how often I see this, and this is one of the main reasons why I, I really suggest to players not to be adjusting their preflop raise amount based on hand strength because when you can actually you know, when you, when you find a guy who you know is raising preflop you know 3.5x with pocket aces uh and 3x with ace king and then he makes it 2.5x um and he actually gets to a showdown and you see that he had jack 10 off suit well you can you can start correlating those preflop raise amounts to hand strength if you can do that and you can correlate a preflop raise amount to a marginal or weakish type hand, then you can three bet you know, pretty wide and a lot of times just get through. So uh, my my standard here, 2.5x, you're really you you know you're looking for you're looking for those opportunities where you can make the three bet and just get through without a flop. And that happens all the time. And then uh, what else do we got? We have four betting the three better. Yeah, you know, I, I recently I've been taking a look at that beyondtells.com site where uh, um, Blake Eastman uh, uses a phrase that you know, he adopts he adopts it to poker. I I had never heard it applied to poker before, and it's this this phrase exploit the exploiter. I really like it. You know, it comes from Beyond Tells. It comes from Blake Eastman. It's it's been said before. Uh, you know, I I actually had to do a little Google search and I saw that you know it was said in. Uh, a couple of uh, computer security blogs, but I'd never heard of it uh, applied in poker, and I really like that phrase, exploit the exploiter. And the idea here is, you know, four betting in those kind of spots where you think that someone is three betting because they see a spot, right? So you you make the four bet. You know, the advantage that this has is that it just looks really strong. If you if you make a four bet preflop, it looks really strong. Uh, the disadvantage is you're really uh, and you're you're putting a lot of your chips at risk, and you have to pretty much be sure that the three better is capable of looking at a spot and trying to take advantage of the spot with a three bet. So uh, that's pretty much going to be it. Now there's a few of these types of preflop spots which we can classify as squeeze plays: um, raising the open limper, three betting the wide opener, and four betting the three better. Uh, basically, a squeeze play is when you're going to have, you know, not only the person that you're trying to uh, trying to steal from, you know, in case number two, raising the open limper, you're trying, you're really trying to get through the uh, the original open limper. Um, when you're three betting the wide opener, four betting the three better, all of these three spots that we talk about could potentially be squeeze plays if there's other people who decide to make that call of the open limp, or decide to make the call of the wide opener, or decide to make the call of the three better. Uh, so, you know, w when you're making a squeeze play, you're going to have to adjust your, your preflop raise amount a little bit upwards, uh, you know, based on, on how many people are in the middle of you and the person you're trying to get through. Uh, generally, what you're thinking is if you can get through that first person that you're attacking, you're going to be able to get through everybody else as long as you make your preflop raise amounts uh, high enough. And generally what I'm looking at... Here's for an open limper. I'm doing my my standard preflop, like we said, 2.5x the big blind or or less, plus the open limp and all the people who are calling him. Three betting the wide opener. You're basically doing like a 2.5x or 3x, whatever the uh, opener's raise is, plus all the people who are calling him. And the same thing with four betting the three better. If someone three bet and gets called, generally that's not really going to be that great of a spot. 
but if you decide to make it, go ahead and adjust your uh, your your four bet amount to uh, you know take into account that guy who made the the call of the three bet. And those are those are going to be squeeze plays. A lot of times, a lot of times they're they're going to be really profitable when they when they when they can get through. But just keep in mind that whole idea of sunk cost. You know, it's always easier. It's always easier to uh, to overestimate fold equity. It's always easier to overestimate the chances that someone's going to get through once they put that you know that first chip in. Once they made that small investment. Uh, and this is why generally I don't think that, that it's a good idea to slow play hands also is this whole idea of sunk cost is because you're trying to uh, you're trying to milk a guy in and the more that someone puts into the middle, the more likely they are to put you know further further uh, you know bets out there. So that's pretty much it. All the preflop spots that I can think of, maybe you guys can think of others. But in our next poker clinic, we're going to talk about some uh, post flop spots, uh, you know sea betting and you know, do, you know, raising the donk lead. I, I, I started coming up with with uh, quite a bit of post flop spots that I could kind of see, uh, but I, I feel like this is kind of enough for a single poker clinic. So that's going to be it. Let's go ahead and get to some questions here, and then we're going to uh, go on the WSOP grind. Let's see what we've got. Oh, we got Scotty Mofo one one one. And R. Norlu just subscribed. Big, big shout out to you guys. We're going to go ahead and get you that Poker Tilt um, digital copy. So check your uh, message box for that after the, uh, after the stream's up. Scotty Mofo and R. Norlu, really appreciate you guys clicking on that sub button. Welcome to the crew. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the stream. Uh, Sherlock asks, you play, you're playing the first hand in a main event with aces preflop and someone pushes all in. Do you call? Do you call? Yes, I'm going to call. Um, I can see an argument for not calling. I really can. Let's say that you're so good, you know, you're Phil Ivey or you're Phil Helmuth, and you figure that your chances of taking that original st uh, stack, right, Sherlock, of in the main event, I think you're going to be looking at 30K. Uh, they might have adjusted it this year, but thirty thousand dollars, thirty k, is going to be your tournament stack. If you feel like you have a better than eighty eight percent chance to to take that thirty k up to you know and double it to sixty k, then I can see an argument for making the fold and waiting for a better spot. But for me personally, I don't really think that my chances of doubling up are going to be better than eighty eight percent. I also I also feel like. I also feel like, you know, if if you do survive that all in, a lot of times you're never going to have to worry about, you know, having another all in in the whole tournament. So, I'm going to go ahead and make the call. I can see an argument for not calling, but if you're not calling, you're you're basically saying that you're willing to give up, you know, the the best uh, all in preflop percentage uh, advantage that you can have. Uh you got to be really confident in your own abilities to um, you know, to to double your stack. And I, I just don't really think that there's anybody who can really make that fold um, and, uh, and, and feel like their, their chances are better making that fold. I, I just don't think it is. And hey, Toshiba Chan, it's good to see you, man. I, get, I got, your, uh, got your message. We're, we're going to have to try to meet up over the Rio here in the next day or two. So uh, definitely looking forward to actually meeting you face to face, man. We got uh, Grinding and Ground saying they love that picture. Oh, it's such a sad picture, isn't it? <laughs> such a sad picture. I mean, look at this bully. Be the bully, but don't look like the bully. I think it's a it's a, a good thing to think about when they're when you're uh, you know trying to make those kind of uh, pre-flop blind steals. And uh, Scotty Mofo says we're talking turning only right now. Yeah, we're basically talking just about tournaments pre-flop. Uh, no limit hold and tournament spots. Uh, in cash games, you're not really ever trying to blind steal. You know, most of the, most of your money in cash games is going to be coming in the, on the river. It, it, most of your money in no limit hold and cash games is going to be coming post flop by getting people to call. Uh, tournaments is a little different, and in tournaments, you're not you you you, you don't really want to see a lot of showdowns. So, spots are you know, blind stealing really important in tournaments. Not so important in cash games. 
Let's see. Uh, Win by TKO says, do you establish a tight image early to take advantage of these spots later when they mean more? Sure, win by TKO. I would say this, though. When you're thinking about table image, um, you know, it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to overestimate the image that you've established. It's, you know, keep in mind that most players at your table aren't really going to be paying that much attention to you. And you might think, oh, well, I haven't played you know, in, in an hour, so they're all going to think that I'm super tight. It's not really what they're going to be thinking. You know, they're, they're a lot more likely to think that you're you know, loose because you played three hands in a row than that you're tight because you haven't played in an hour. Uh, just don't overestimate the uh, the focus that the the other players are making, and don't overestimate your own table image because I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, "Oh, you know, I made a raise there," which I, you know he has to know that I'm you know that I have a super tight image because I haven't played in a in an hour. You can't really expect that your opponents are going to be thinking you know, about you what you think they think about you. There's actually a whole book about this topic, saying that you know it's called Mind Wise, and the idea was, uh, we're, you know, as humans, we're we're pretty good at like empathizing with other other people, but what we're really, really, really bad at is getting into the, their heads and thinking about what they think about us. We have too much cognitive bias where we're thinking about, you know, we're overconfident in our own abilities, and we uh, we look at ourselves in kind of a narcissistic way, we think that everyone's paying attention to us when most of the time they aren't. So it's very easy to overestimate your own table image. And I would really, uh, I would really hesitate against thinking that you're going to be able to get through a blind steal or you're going to be able to make a four bet, uh, you know, move successfully because the guy knows that you're tight. You know, they, they, a lot of times, you know, that a lot of times that's going to be how a bad beat story is set up. So, uh, and just be careful about that. Let's see. Four betting the three better difference with stack sizes. Uh, I'm not really sure what you're asking there, Scotty Mofo, if you want to re rephrase it. Uh, and uh, our Norlu, yes, you're going to get the book. You're getting a book, buddy. You're going to go ahead and get that DRM free digital version of Poker Tilt. So uh, I'll make sure that you're uh, sent that. I'll, I'll make sure XMO sends that as soon as this, uh, this poker clinic's over. Dogfish Phil says, thanks for the info, Dutch. Great info. Really appreciate it. No problem, man. We're going to be talking more about uh, post-flop spots and you know turn spots and river spots uh, at the next poker clinic. And we're also, um, I'm going to make a whole separate poker clinic about uh, betting on the river. Because that's one of the most important parts about poker, especially in cash games, but also in tournaments. Is you know Because of that exponential nature of poker, you're going to just be uh, getting a lot more money in. Uh, on your river bets than you can on your turn bets and your you know your flop bets and your pre-flop bets. So it's kind of important to, to kind of think about all the different motivations and all the different types of river bets that there are out there. Poker Neo talking about uh, I'll never fold if I feel I have 70% equity or more. It's so hard to define how much equity you have in a situation. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's basically what you're trying to do. Such a, it's such a game of incomplete information. We've got not a computer. Dutch, you're pretty open with these pre-flop thoughts in your stream. Raising open limpers with any two, raising the donk lead. Obviously, WSOP players see this when they watch your stream. Have you seen more players on the site playing back at you more in these spots, knowing you're opening lighter? You know, not a computer, I would say, yeah, for sure. But I don't really think that it's so much because of the things I say on the stream as it is just because they realize that, you know, a... a a lot of times someone who's raising on the button or the cutoff is uh you know making a move so uh, yeah i would say that you you do get played back at and a lot of times that's when you're going to have to you know do what blake eastman says exploit the exploiter and you know four bet lighter or make the call and you know play a post flop game against him um generally when i'm raising and i get i get played back at you know, all things being equal, I'm a lot more likely to continue with the hand rather than just fold. Just because I don't want to set a bad precedent for, uh, you know, for being willing to give up uh, a pre-flop uh, raise attempt without seeing a flop. McCord RM, given that mind wise link, thank you very much for that, McCord. What's up, Hip Eight Cheap? It's good to see you. He says, sorry, I'm late, guys. I had a book report due and I had to finish it because I don't, didn't want to get detention. <laughs> Sorry to hear that, man. I'm so glad that I don't have homework anymore. Uh, Scotty Mofo saying, make friends with players on your left. Does, does it hold its weight in your opinion? 
I don't really think so, Scotty. I think that you're better off. Uh, I, I actually think it can kind of go against you because you know it, it can have it, it can have the opposite of the desired effect you want. You can actually have people who decide to go ahead and make a move because they think that you think that they wouldn't make the move since you've been friendly. Um, I I, I kind of feel like. Uh, it, uh, you know, you're not you're not playing with a bunch of idiots. You're playing with with you know thinking, feeling you know people who are trying to win the tournament. Uh, so making friends with them, you know, that's fine if you want to you know have a conversation. But don't expect that they're going to uh, lay down their blinds to you just because you've been talking about the weather. You know, I think that generally um, it's okay to be you know it's good actually to be friendly at the table, and you don't really want people to be gunning for you and rooting for you to get knocked out but i don't think that you know if you make friends with players on the left they're going to be a lot less likely to play back at you i think that probably they're going to be looking at the spot and looking at the situation the same way that you would be if you're in their situation so uh yeah i think that's probably going to be it we're going to go ahead and uh shut the poker clinic down we got Angot saying, how does one become the bully but not look like the bully? If you have a high VPIP, you're the bully, right? Pretty much, Angot. Um, and what I would say is how you can be the bully but not look like the bully is, you know, don't, don't make four blind steals in a row. Don't steal the same person's big blind three orbits in a row. Um, you know, kind of space it out a little bit. And, you know, if, if you're, let's say that you're at a ten-handed table and you're winning you know, 15% of the pots, um, you're winning more than your fair share, right? You, you want to be winning more than your fair share, but, you know, if that, if that percentage gets too high, the whole table is going to kind of turn on you, and you don't, want, you, 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 you don't want that to happen. So don't get too greedy. Realize that you're going to have to give some spots to some of the other, the, the other players at the table, particularly when you're up against uh, some stronger players. You know, take turns attacking the weak players you you, know, you can't just um you you can't be the only lion gobbling up all the gazelles you gotta you gotta share the meal a little bit um and and share the spots so uh yeah my general rule is you won't see me make like three blind steals in a row rarely two and you won't see me uh stealing the same big blind you know two or three times in a row usually i go ahead and give an orbit so that's that's kind of how you can uh, be the bully but not look like the bully. Uh, three five suited forever asks, what is the best markup to charge backers for a series like the WSOP? Uh, I think one point two is probably you know the standard. I feel like if uh, you know for bigger events you can charge less, one point one or even one point oh five. Uh, some of the events are going to have such a uh, an upside to to winning them that you know if if you're going to be on the rail for the main event or you can sell at face and play it I'd be selling at face and bony fish saying I remember the other night uh, Dutch kinda sat out one orbit after being very aggressive a few hands in a row that's kinda what I'm talking about you know you don't want to especially when you get exposed especially if you actually have to turn over your hand and it's complete bullshit that's a good that's a good uh, indicator that maybe it's time to take some time off and uh, just kind of make them realize that you're not trying to steal every single big blind. You're not trying to steal every single hand. Um, take some time off when you get exposed. Okay, guys, I'm gonna shut this down and I'm gonna reload it for uh, the WSP uh, the WSP grind. Make sure to uh, hang out with us and uh, um, if you're just joining us, make sure to click on that follow button to get notified when we go live. We're gonna turn the sub chat off. We're gonna go back to our normal Saturday grind. And to our new subs, thank you so much, uh, Scotty Mofo, and uh, uh, who was our who was our other one? It was uh, our uh, our Norlu, uh, our Norlu and Scotty Mofo. Big big shout out to you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that XML gets you that uh, that DRM download link. It's already sent. It's already sent. So check your Twitch message box for that uh, that that book link and. Uh, Welcome to the crew, you guys. Thanks so much for supporting the stream. We're going to be right back in about five minutes once the delay catches up. Thank you guys so much for being here, and make sure to join us next time for part two of the Poker Clinic, where we talk about post-flop spots. And uh, the, the next Poker Clinic after that, we're going to be talking about river betting, which is going to be a really good one. Thank you guys again. We'll be right back. <laughs>